so much, and uh, thank you for joining us here at Housing uh, Works Home uh, at uh, Roger Williams University at the beautif beautiful downtown Providence campus. And we appreciate you very much coming today. Uh, and uh, here today, we'll give you a little sneak peek of some of the facts and information in the fact book. And I know a number of you are joining us at lunch as well, too, um, when we'll hear from Dan McHugh from the Joint Center on Housing. And Dan's joining us this morning as well, too. Jo uh, Dan, please <laughs> wave and raise. <laughs> Thank you. And you'll hear more from Dan at lunch uh, if you're coming uh, to that as well, too. I know some of you are not coming to lunch. Um, and so as you leave, uh, we'll, in the back of the room, we'll give you your copy of your fact book. So, uh, please make sure you uh, stop by and pick that up and we have copies of some of our other more recent reports too from our scholar series on student homelessness and gentrification issues. So those are also in the back of the room for you to grab. Um, a couple of uh, things too, I, also in the back of the room if you haven't yet visited, we have our uh, colleagues from the U.S. Census. Uh, here, as you know, we'll be doing um, the census next year. Uh, really, really critical uh, in Rhode Island for us to get a complete and accurate count. Um, many of the programs that we rely on from the federal government are based on population and formulas. And if we lose a uh, in congressional seats, and if we lose a congressional seat, that will be a huge impact in Rhode Island on uh, key programs like CDBG and HOME and other um, things, the basic tools that we use to build and develop housing in addition to a wide array of programs. And I know our colleagues at the Census have some information and data for you to share. So please, if you're here representing organizations, please bring that information back to your organizations. <coughs> Try to uh, host and hold as many uh, public awareness events and engagement events that, that you can in your orga organizations. Um, post things in our housing developments. Uh, we really need all hands on deck uh, to make sure that we get an accurate count. So thank you for being with us uh, today. We appreciate it. Uh, a big, big thanks um, to, from me to our great Housing Works team. Um, we have uh, Annette, who you'll hear from in a few minutes, who's fact book mother <laughs> and, uh, and has really been working very hard uh, through most of the year, really. It's a year-round project, but particularly the last couple of months, uh, pulling the details together. Amy Cole, I don't see yet, but Amy's our events and communications person and has been doing a wonderful job, as she always does, pulling all of the details together. We have Karen L. Legrand, who joined us most re uh, recently, not recently anymore, I can't, I've got to stop saying that, but in March, working on our Healthy Homes work. Um, and Christina Brown, our policy analyst, and I don't see Chris, but I, oh, she's, I think she's still greeting people at the door. But Chris has done a number of things, including uh, recently uh, helping to author the student homelessness report that I mentioned. So we have a great team, and uh, you'll hear uh, more about the work throughout the day. So yeah, I'll, we'll uh, start with Annette, uh, who will give us a quick overview of the uh, fact book, and then I'll call our panelists up uh, to uh, for their comments and their thoughts. So turn it over to you, Annette. Hey, thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, good morning. Can everybody morning. hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, Brenda, thanks for kicking us off. Um, as Brenda mentioned, my name is Annette Bourne. I'm the Research and Policy Director here at Housing Works. I'd like to start by offering thanks to many who make this book possible. Uh, Brenda, first, who always supports my ideas and offers helpful uh, and expert critiques of how to get where I want to go and even applauds my detours sometimes. Um, my Housing Works colleagues who uh, likely hear too much from me over the number of months but intensifying in those last weeks. And others who have joined our research family over the last couple of years Dr. Per Belstock is here with us, uh, UNH. Um, I don't see our summer intern, Jeremy Berman, but Jeremy did a huge lift on this year's fact book as we delved into comprehensive plans. Um, I'd also like to thank our Bonner Community Fellows, one of whom will be at our lunch. Uh, they only started a few short weeks ago, but some of our uh, website has already been updated, our uh, town and city pages, uh, due to their work. Um, also, our colleagues at GrowSmart, who can't be here today, they moved out of our building down the street, uh, who provided some advice regarding our, trans our approach to transportation. And then at the local level, um, the staff at RIPTA um, have offered some guidance and help with this book, as well as planners and zoning officials across the state um, 
who we called upon to get locally reported data regarding building permits or to get some clarification as we looked at the comprehensive plans and zoning ordinances. Um, in particular, uh, the City of Providence's inspections and standards staff who worked very much for a while to get me uh, Providence's 2018 building permits. It's not as easy as you think. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, our advisory board as well as our sponsors. Um, this year's Housing Works uh, Housing Factbook uh, really attempts to untangle the myriad aspects of what it creates, of what creates housing affordability, and how we can provide more of it. I hope it comes to be thought of as a user guide to housing affordability for advocates who may not be aware of the infrastructure and planning and zoning issues, as well as for our leaders in, of state and municipalities who may need more information regarding the crisis of housing affordability that thousands of Rhode Islanders face every day. So, uh, why are we here? Um, we are here because opportunity for well-being starts at home. Whether you are older and one of the 16% uh, of RI population who's over 65, or younger, 20% of our Rhode Island population under 18, and still enjoy jumping on beds. Uh, we know that housing affects educational outcomes. A little under 20% of Rhode Islanders have bachelor's degrees. We know it affects our health outcomes with millions of dollars that come into our state for safe water, lead, asthma, all sorts of housing conditions that are related to our public health issues. Um, and our economy, both our macro economy and jobs, as well as our micro economy and whether or not people can succeed based on how much or little they get to spend on their housing. Um, ultimately, what I've come to understand and I've learned at a conference a number of years ago, and I've always wanted to use this quote, so I apologize if it doesn't seem germane. To me, it's germane. Um, but this sums up what I see as a conundrum of civilization, which is managing coexistence in a shared space. This is uh, Patsy Healy, a uh, British urban planner who uh, summed up planning in this way. And really, we have one planet, one municipality, one neighborhood, and we have to all kind of live together in a way that is mutually agreeable. So how do we do this? Well, we take a bunch of people, whether they are residents, developers, business people, elected officials, and they may want housing, real estate development, roads, bridges, public transportations, and they go to a government source, might be federal, state, municipal, and they either need funding or they need zoning to allow it. And throughout these different operations, there are many conflicting interests and missions to serve. So the results, unfortunately, are often like this, where we are double knotted and really can't move ahead and certainly can't move ahead quickly. However, uh, there are many of us here in this room and throughout our state who actually work to make it this. Uh, this particular photo is of 60 King Street, which was celebrated just last year. 60 new rental apartments from our friends at One Neighborhood Builders from an old knife factory. So this year, uh, our approach has really involved an intense amount of work uh, and an earnest, earnest intention to report what we found. There's always room for improvement, so I you know, urge people to get back to me if they feel like something wasn't represented just right and how can we improve on that. But the intention here is to start an earnest conversation. So uh, our goal is to how to ensure our success more often than not. And what we know is that across the United States, whoops, in many municipalities, they are really thinking about housing in innovative ways. Not all of these are going to fit the Rhode Island landscape, but in some cases, the city of Minneapolis has eliminated single family zone. Um, many other municipalities are looking to create zoning that would allow for some of the new forms of homes that we know can cost safe. Some of the tinier homes, some of the ADU, accessory dwelling units. Uh, we even have adult dorms now and uh, the latest article that I downloaded are granny pods. Yeah. So uh, for those of you in that grandparent stage, look out for that pod coming, coming soon to your local neighborhood. Um, 
Many of these are being done not just for affordability, but also to overcome a long history of discrimination um, that has resulted in significant disparities that affect many life outcomes. Our state right now is in the process of doing a strategic plan on housing and on transportation. There is a nexus between these two that we attempt to look at in this book, and we are really hoping to provide some grist for the mill in discussion across state agencies, with private stakeholders, across our municipalities and our neighborhoods. So, this year's book, we again look at state, regional, and municipalities. Uh, the regions here are the same ones used by the Projecting Future Housing Needs uh, report done in 2016. For the deeper dive of those in the room, uh, these are the U.S. Census Bureau Public Use Microdata Areas, or PUMAs, for those of us who want to be cool. Um, most of them align with Rhode Island counties, except for Providence County, which actually breaks out into four regions. And we're using these to look at systems that are not confined to a municipality, like transportation. So in each section, we've researched some new facts to add to the story of housing affordability. So starting with our statewide housing indicators, updated this year for the first time since 2016 is an estimate of what was called decreased purchasing power in, private, in prior years. But it's really representing a cost to our state, our local economies, and the well-being of each Rhode Islander. As you can see here, we are estimating nearly three quarters of a billion dollars that is spent in overspending on housing that could be used in many other ways by the renters and homeowners in Rhode Island. Uh, also new this year is a little project that involved looking up all of the federal programs that the National Center for Healthy Homes uh, assigns as contributing to healthy homes. These funds come from a number of agencies and within multiple departments within those agencies. Um, we're really pleased that the Rhode Island Alliance for Healthy Homes, under Karen Ell's leadership, is now a program at Housing Works, and we hope to begin to connect the dots for better outcomes of Rhode Islanders within healthy homes. Our uh, standard uh, measure of affordability worsened again this year, uh, where there's even fewer municipalities where an income of 50,000 will afford to buy a home, and only four at 70,000. Uh, the uh, we had an alarming increase of nearly 24% in the number of students reported as homeless. Um, that is a different measure than what HUD considers homelessness. And lastly, our per capita contribution did spike this year to $21.90. However, that is going to be a temporary bump as those bond funds are expended by the end of this year. So we look forward to a day where we actually have a permanent funding stream so we don't have to you know, plan developments only within these bond funds. So since uh, publishing uh, the project Projecting Future Housing Needs, uh, we've continued to look at the regional data. I, like I said, I urge you to look at the website. I find it helpful to look at these systems across regions. Um, I'm not from Rhode Island, so I think in larger geographies, and so I apologize if this is different for some people here, but I go to South County a lot, and people do talk about South County. They don't necessarily just say they come from one municipality or another. So we are looking at a cross-section of factors on these pages, housing, transportation, jobs, health institutions, and education. Um, in this year's book, uh, we, I was inspired by the work that Chris Brown and I got to do in our class at Roger Williams under uh, Professor Jeanette Williams uh, with the Community Partnership Center and our colleagues at GrowSmart where we took a look at potential uh, transit-oriented uh, districts, development districts. So each regional page also provides an estimate of affordability that uses the proprietary data we get from the Warren Group and this is pairs uh, specialty, and uh, we really come to the conclusion that um, in most of our regions, a majority of current renters and homeowners could not like rebuy a house in that same region. 
If you look at this from a state level, you're looking at 60%. So if you were one of those people living in Cranston or Newport, you probably couldn't buy there again at this moment. We also provide examples of the different kinds of long-term affordable homes across each region. And one thing many of them have in common is the receipt of building homes Rhode Island um, funds. We also take a look at the TOD sites that are actually already in our state that are being built right now, uh, Pawtucket Central <coughs> Falls, Conant um, Thread District, as well as the Warwick City Center. And while it is not designated as a TOD, all of downtown Providence is a naturally occurring TOD. Um, given its proximity of the Providence train station to Kennedy Plaza, um, the mixed use zoning that is allowing for high density development, and the downtown transit connector, which is currently under construction, that will extend frequent transit access from Providence Station to the hospital district. They've also zoned many other areas that are served by the R line on Broad Street in North Main. Our biggest changes, um, formatting wise, uh, came to the municipal pages this year. I really urge you to look at the municipal overview page on page 33 before you dive into this section this year, because there are things new that you need to understand how they came about. So the first section, the top of the page, are housing costs for single family and rents. We only have a five year comparison now. Uh, we polled and that was okay for most people. Also, there was a change to the methodology of how Rhode Island Housing collects those rents, so only a five year comparison was possible. Our affordability gap is now uh, bigger in terms of being able to present the graphic larger for people to read what the difference is between what people have to pay in their local municipality versus what a regional income is, as well as a new look at cost burdens, which actually gives you a number of people who are considered cost burdened. Now, at the state level, 148,000 seems a little high to get your head around, but when you go down to the regional level, those numbers are more digestible, although they're still alarming because you basically learn that about a third of households across our state, across our regions, are housing cost burden. And then lastly, and this is the big one, um, we've added a section on housing and development conditions, which looks a generalized overview of access to public water and sewer, and I emphasize generalized overview, especially for the planners in the region. I'm not saying a percentage of households that are served by that infrastructure. I'm trying to get people to start conversations so they can ask those deeper dive questions. We also looked at multifamily zoning by right of three units or more. Yes, I read every single municipality's municipal zoning table. And I am still on summer vacation. And I am still here to talk about it. Okay. Um, we also populated the 10 most common housing strategies from all 39 municipal comprehensive plans, or in some cases where I had to talk to a planner directly because their comp plan was not available. We also contacted all the municipalities directly about their building permits. And some of the things, and 14 actually either told me, yes, the Census Bureau numbers are right, or they gave me locally reported data, which unearthed things like accessory dwelling units or multifamilies that were being created out of a reuse of another building, which would not be reported in that building permit survey. By including the local data, Providence, went from one unit, which was reported on the building permit survey, to 892 units. Of the other municipalities that reported, those disparities were not as great. So I'm not suggesting that there is like a thousand percent <laughs> increase in all of these units across the state. But in order to understand how we are creating units, what kind of units we are creating, it would be great to have this discussion statewide. Finally, in looking at the long-term affordable homes created since the 2005 low and moderate income housing chart, which I am all too familiar with, 
we uh, create a net gain, which means we're not looking at group home beds, which is a number that fluctuates. It's also licensed beds. They don't represent production. Sadly, in some cases, we also see a loss in some municipalities. That is not for lack of effort by Rhode Island Housing and our other partners. Uh, it is sometimes because a landlord just does not see the value in extending that affordability. Um, this round of BHRI is the first to offer preservation as a use, um, which is great. Uh, however, it also now means less funding for the creation of new units. One uh, note I want people to understand is the number of BHRI units reported is the number of units funded. So they may not be yet showing up in that actual built um, number. Uh, we've pulled all of this together in an effort to create helpful, realistic conversations about how to confront the barriers and build potential, including through a hard look at whether these strategies are working and how they can be bolstered if not. We also have to have a discussion about funding for more infrastructure around our villages or upgrading in settings where there's urban and suburban areas to allow for more density. Built out is only a concept within the reality of current zoning. In concluding, I would like to remind people we are part of the Homes RI Coalition. There's Katie in the audience. HomesRI.org, please go visit. The uh, policy agenda, we hope to move forward. Construction and preservation of affordable homes. Rental subsidies for low and very low income households. Supportive services for those in supportive housing. And the removal of legal, administrative, regulatory, and economic barriers to the creation of quality homes. And with that, I think I'm on time. You are. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Annette, and thank you especially for all of your hard work um, getting us to this point. So, and, and more to come, sorry to tell you, but uh, <laughs> glad, to, uh, glad to have the information today. I'd ask our panelists to come up, and while, while they do that, I do want to acknowledge a couple of people in the room, including our Housing Works Advisory Board members. If you, I know a number of you are here, and some more will be joining us at lunch. Please raise your hand if you're a member of our Housing uh, Works Advisory Board, our chair, Steve. Uh, and Tony is in the back, um, and Michelle and Adrian and Rhonda and uh, 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 Amy and a whole bunch of other people, I'm sure I'm missing somebody, uh, are joining us. So thank you again, as always, for all your support and guidance. Um, I'd also um, uh, Annette mentioned Homes RI, but I want to uh, give a plug. We have some information in the back of the room about an upcoming forum on December 11th uh, that Homes RI and LISC uh, uh, Housing Network and LISC are taking the lead in organizing, and so we're very happy. I uh, will be talking a lot more about housing at that forum, and we're also happy that the governor just announced yesterday uh, uh, another forum on November 14th uh, to talk about housing issues and workforce housing, um, and some more details uh, as that develops as well. So feels like we're building some momentum here and uh, have uh, an opportunity to kind of shine a spotlight on some of these important issues and we hope that the fact book uh, remains a helpful tool in that process and I'm sure it will. So with that, I will um, uh, turn it over to, um, or introduce our panelists. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, before I do that so I don't forget, I, want, I already acknowledged the Housing Works team and thank you Annette for mentioning Pierre who was sitting right in front of me and I still uh, forgot to mention to you, but Pierre, thank you for all your guidance as well. Um, I also want to thank the Roger Williams team here. Uh, we've been now part of Roger Williams family since 2014, and it is just wonderful to work with so many of the support teams and services here. And I know Heidi and Molly are here today, and our friend Melanie uh, <coughs> at, uh, from Advancement Office uh, are, uh, have been so helpful in organizing the event this morning and also this afternoon, um, and we appreciate it. Our new Roger Williams president will hopefully be joining us at lunch, so if you're I uh, enjoy coming at lunch. You'll have a chance to hear from him briefly as well. So, so with that, um, I thank our panelists, and we have some uh, longtime friends and supporters here today. Uh, but we ask them to come to uh, to give us some reactions uh, to these uh, to these numbers. Unfortunately, some of these numbers are, are not new numbers for sure. Uh, it's a, a persistent problem, as we know. 
uh, but again, trying to make the connections between transportation, health, and economic growth uh, is what we try to do constantly with the fact book. So um, we, to my left and at the far end, we have Carol Ventura here at her, not her first fact book event, but her first fact book event as new ED at Red Island Housing. So yay. For a very a longtime friend, Anna Noves, uh, from Department of Health, who uh, was here also our, uh, on a panel that we had not too long ago on gentrification brief and other things, and is our one of our go-to people among a, no a number of other colleagues at Department of Health uh, here to give us the healthy homes perspective. And then a longtime friend and supporter, Scott Evadijan, uh, who many of us know is the uh, former mayor of Warwick and now uh, general manager at RIPT. Did I say your title general manager at RIPT? Close enough. Uh, close enough. <laughs> <laughs> at RIPT, and I know his colleague Amy uh, Patin is here as well, too. And uh, his team has been enormously helpful as we, again, try to weave the uh, transportation and housing link. As Scott knows, my um, uh, transportation is near and dear to my heart. My father, for many years, uh, worked at RIPTA, started cleaning buses on the third shift, and then ultimately, when he retired, was the director of transportation. And so I know a lot about RIPTA <laughs> and RIPTA's history as well. And so always happy to see worlds collide together. So uh, thank you for taking the time uh, to join us today. Uh, with that, I will turn to Carol first um, to talk about her general reactions um, and then uh, also uh, ask you to think about this question or to weave this question into your comments about the scoring of applications for low-income housing tax credit and bond funds and other housing programs. Um, how does the scoring take into consideration the presence of public water and sewer and public transportation, some of the issues that Annette raised? Um, as key things that we need to start thinking about. But please, just give us your general thoughts, too. Thank you. Um, well, there's a lot of information in the fact book, and congratulations to everyone on the team for another successful launch of a fact book. I know how much effort goes into um, planning this process. Um, for me, the biggest takeaway is, although we're making progress, we, we continue to see people cost burden in Rhode Island, and that's that's unfortunate. I mean, we're creating jobs, but people are still paying way too much um, for housing, and um, we're not developing enough housing. I think we're preserving at a pretty good pace, um, but we're just not developing fast enough to keep up with the demand. And I think if you look at the fact book, you can. Um, look at how expensive it is to live in some parts of, of the state, buying a home in some of the rural areas is it's just outrageous. Mm -hmm. um, the average Rhode Islander cannot afford to live in many communities in the state. Um, the housing bond, I think, has, has helped deploying $40 million, but it's going to be gone, as Annette mentioned, by the end of the year that money is going to be gone and we may produce and preserve a thousand units, but we're still falling short. Um, I think the fact book um, puts it front and center for elected officials and municipal leaders that we need to do more and that they need to focus on the needs of the residents in their community. Um, I don't think all of the news is bad though. I think you've highlighted a lot of key developments that have happened over the past few years and I'm, I'm, I'm happy that Rhode Island Housing played a small role. In, in making that happen, so I think that's a, a great thing. I, I don't know, if we're getting feedback there for a minute, but yeah. I think we're okay. Yeah. Okay, um, so let me talk a little bit about the planning that's taking place right now. So Rhode Island Housing and the Office of Housing and Community Development are partnering to look at three key state documents, and that is uh, the state's consolidated plan, the analysis of impediments to um, fair housing, and also the uh, state strategic housing plan, which has not been updated since 2006. So we are conducting a series of community events, engagement, um, public meetings, pop-up events. That's from my communications group. I don't quite know what pop-up event means, but um, apparently it's very successful. Um, yeah, they, they tell me it's great. Um, so, yeah, young and hip, and they are young and hip. Should be back here, and they are young and hip, and I'm just old and you know. Um, so we are collecting a lot of data, and um, 
you know, it's not too late. We are collecting data through October 31st. You can go to our website and under research and um, I think it's research and policy, there is a, a web page that you can see all of the feedback that has <coughs> come in from this process um, as well as completing a short survey. And I encourage everyone, please complete the survey. We need as much feedback from all Rhode Islanders as possible. It's the only way we're going to come out of this planning with um, a path forward that accommodates all Rhode Islanders, not just one specific population, but everyone in Rhode Island. So once we close down the survey uh, in October, we will then, um, our consultants will step up and start analyzing the data and the feedback and begin forming, begin to form goals and strategies and policies around um, what everyone has provided. Um, and then after the first of the year, we'll re-engage with the public to show you these goals and strategies and policies. Again, take your feedback, make adjustments as necessary, and finalize these documents uh, in the spring. So that's where we're going. Shall I go right into the qualified yeah, please, plan? Please okay. keep going. All right. So um, in terms of Rhode Island Housing and the Housing Resources Commission and the Office of Housing and Community Development and the alignment of state and federal programs um, with transportation, um, let me first speak to what is probably the most powerful tool we have in the state of Rhode Island to build affordable rental homes, and that is the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. Rhode Island Housing is the allocator for the state of Rhode Island. We get um, approximately 3.4 million in housing tax credits, and it is a highly competitive resource, right? And so it can take a developer three or four years um, to get a project funded through this process. Um, we score proposals that come through the door, and um, it's outlined in the state's qualified allocation plan. It's probably 200 pages that you will never want to read. But um, buried within that document and is... we'll read it. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. In July, on the beach. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and scoring really determines um, the projects that get funded in Rhode Island, right? So it's, it's about cost effectiveness and leveraging, and also within the document is additional points for proximity to public transportation, um, properties uh, that are located within um, growth centers, um, access to public <coughs> infrastructure like sewer and water. So there is scoring for um, those areas. The one thing I want to mention, though, it's a balance, right? Because if we want to create affordable housing in Gloucester, in Richmond, and in those areas, we're not going to have access to public infrastructure, right? We have to rely on <coughs> septic systems and wells, so it's a balancing act as we want to create affordable housing opportunities across the state. The Housing Resources Commission is the agency in charge of allocating the state bond funds. And we are a partner with the Housing Resources Commission in that we administer the funds on their behalf. Um, while this current bond does not have priority points for um, access to um, public transportation or um, public infrastructure, the, the scoring and the threshold criteria actually references the con plan and also the land use plan, and, and both of those documents make a priority for development within areas that, has, that have um, public infrastructure and also access to public transportation. So those are two areas where um, I see the nexus between scoring and allowing federal and state um, resources with public transit and um, public infrastructure. Okay. Thank you. Why don't we keep going down the line, and our good colleague from Department of Health, if you can talk a little bit about your uh, reactions, um, but also, uh, obviously, Department of Health has been doing a huge amount of work on social determinants of health and uh, the critical disparities across our state in those areas, and how can we continue to build our relationship working together on health and housing and other disparities. Sure, thank you. So first, congratulations. It was an amazing, uh, it's an amazing 
job that you do every year, uh, bring, bringing us and together to reflect on housing. And, um, and unfortunately, while we do have some good news, I think the overwhelming uh, feeling continues to be of how much more uh, we need to do and how consistent the bad news continue to be. But uh, that being said, it also, uh, as Carol was mentioning, it, it requires maybe a different approach and a different kind of coalition and strategic thinking uh, of how to address housing, where we move away from our traditional focus. So when I, when I think about housing, I think you, you think about housing first in absolute, like just do we just have enough housing? Uh, then you think about housing, do you have enough uh, safe, healthy, affordable housing? Uh, then you think about do you have enough uh, housing that offers people who are the most vulnerable population what they need? Do we have enough supportive housing? Do we, uh, do we have enough recovery housing? So, and, and when I think about it this way, it's like, no, no, no. <laughs> um, and so we don't have just enough housing plain. We don't have enough safe, affordable housing. We do not have enough supportive housing, recovery housing in our state. So it says to me that whatever solutions we're gonna be thinking about, strategic planning, we need to bring a different set of stakeholders and a different framework to that conversation. So at the Department of Health, yes, we've been doing a lot addressing uh, social environmental determinants of health. We put uh, the social environmental determinants of health as a lead uh, uh, overarching priority for the work we do, and we use that as the lens through which we do everything at the health department. So. Uh, you, our key or flagship kind of intervention and initiative that reflects that is the health equity zones where we are truly um, relying on our community and the power that exists within the community, the voice of our residents, the voice of the stakeholders that live in a place to let us know what health means to them to let us know what are the problems that they think we need to fix, to let us know what are the assets that are in their communities that we can rely on to help us move forward. And housing comes up every single time. It's supposed to be a health initiative, but it is about housing, it is about transportation, it is about education, it is the lack of trust in community and police relationships, those are the issues that are impacting people's health. And so unless we agree that we can no longer think about health in that isolated three capital hill perspective where we're talking about diabetes and obesity, that health means that we need to be talking about housing, that we need to be talking about transportation, that we need to talk about education, then we are gonna continue to have the same bad data. Uh, not bad data, excellent data that reflects really bad <laughs> results and bad outcomes because that is what we are facing. So even a housing strategy to say that the same way I think about health and I say that health cannot just be about diabetes, a housing strategy cannot just be about housing and safe and affordable housing. It needs to be about a strategy for the communities that we're talking about. What are the needs of the population that we're talking about? What is the state of transportation in those communities? What is the access that people have to affordable housing, to supportive housing, to housing, period? My oldest son, not to bring, not the oldest, number three. I have four years. <laughs> um, so my, my child, number three, who is a grown man of the turning 29 this year, he was moving uh, from one place to another looking for a house and he was looking for an apartment to rent for him and his young daughter of five and his wife, and he looked for over a year, mm -hmm. trying to find an affordable apartment in Rhode Island, in not just Rhode Island, 
He wanted to stay in Pawtucket, I'm from Pawtucket. Mm -hmm. He wanted to stay close to mom and to <laughs> grandma for the kid. <laughs> but it took him over one year. I remember when I rented my first apartment in Rhode Island in Pawtucket, it was like $500 a month yeah. for a three bedroom apartment. <laughs> 20 years ago, not that far, not that, no. not that man. Mm -hmm. He could not find anything that was cheaper than $1,000 mm -hmm. in Pawtucket for a two bedroom apartment. Mm -hmm. That is crazy. Mm -hmm. Nothing included, by the way. <laughs> so those are the issues that we're facing. But why was it hard for him? Because maybe he doesn't have the income that he needs. He's not making, he's not a rich man, he's a young guy starting his life. He has a good job. But between the two of them, they can't. So we need to address employment policy as we talk about housing. Because the affordability is not just affordability of the housing, but it's how can the individual afford that house. So we, what kind of jobs do we have that make people not just survive, but live? And it means that our education policies need to lead us to create and graduate kids from school that can go off to college or to a job. So those are the ways that I I think about housing that makes it extremely complicated, mm -hmm. but that means also that at the end of the day, it is the right folks that are in this room. Because it cannot be a housing solution with the housing advocates and the usual housing partners. We need to bring all of those different sectors. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about a vision for our communities in Rhode Island of which housing is a critical component along with everything else. I think you're preaching to the choir, but yeah. hallelujah, yeah. amen to that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> now, well, now, how do we make an action, right? And how do we do it? And just, I mean, and thank you for sharing your, uh, your, your personal connection on this. We hear it all the time. The minute I, I hear, or somebody knows I work in housing, it's only two seconds later that I hear a housing story about Something, somebody in their family, some other group, uh, somebody that they know that's looking for housing. Just curious, how many of you have the, kind of the same experience that, that you have with a kid who can't find a place to buy or rent or, or some, a family member that is housing issues? Raise your hand. You don't have to share your story. Just, just curious. Lots of hands going up. Not, not a surprise. So yeah, no. <laughs> On our own Housing Works team, we, we know we have people. <laughs> Um, so that's, uh, that's it, right, and trying to make that connection and make people understand that, uh, I'd say it all the time, that affordable housing is kind of the Rodney Dangerfield of issues, and I know I need a new cultural reference because nobody under 30 knows who I'm talking about anymore, but, uh, but it's, it just doesn't get the respect because I think people think, oh, that's not me. But in reality, it is you, and it's all, it's all of us. And when we start to kind of uh, tell that story and broaden the message a little bit more, uh, people seem to understand it and understand the connections and know that it's about their son, it's their daughter, it's their mother who's trying to age in place, it's, you know, all of those connections. So telling those stories better um, and more frequently is, is also what we need to do. So, so with that, let me uh, turn um, to our last panelist here, um, Scott, um, to talk about um, the key findings and his reactions, but also uh, to try to address the question about how do we make public transportation a more relevant topic um, for municipalities um, and so that they understand the connections to their local economy. Thanks, Brenda. First and foremost, congratulations, Carol. We're <laughs> thrilled to have you in your, in your, not new role, but new role in the agency. Great. Um, it's uh, kind of going to be a great partnership um, between Rhode Island Housing and River. Um, so we move 58,000 people a day um, somewhere in the state of Rhode Island. And we like to say, Amy's in the back, and we like to say that we connect people to work, to school, and to life. Now, one of the ways that, that we do that is in attempting and trying to look at all of our routes, ridership, where are there, where are there gaps, where can we fill in better? Um, and one of the initiatives that Amy did when she was our planning director uh, was the creation of the R line. And now you look at the high frequency that was created there and the number of people who take the R line every day. Um, and you try to piece that into how, how do we expand that into other areas so that we have that high frequency? And the downtown transit connector will 
do that in the six steps between um, the train to Providence Station and Rhode Island Hospital. But then we need to think more on how how does transit work into all of the other pieces and working with the Department of Health and Rhode Island Housing and um, lots of advocates. There are, there are different ways that that can happen. And so we are currently undertaking a transit master plan um, for the state to look at what is the future? How, how, do we can make, how do we make those connections and how do we connect those dots across the state when really what RIPTA has evolved into over the last 53 years is a Metro Providence transit system. And so how do you still do your statewide mandate to be everywhere, but really focus on where the urban core that's actually using a service? So um, we've done a lot of analysis as to where we are, and I can tell you that um, right now, the average American household spends about $9,700 a year in transportation costs. And so when you try to piece that all together, it's the second largest outlay um, in any home. So continuing on the not young and not hip, um, <laughs> trying to understand what motivates I people. I said Rodney Dangerfield, so we know where I am. <laughs> um, trying to understand what, what's the motivator factor here. There was a focus group um, up at Brown with a group of millennials who were talking about transportation. So I went to sit in the back and listen so I could understand, you know, I remember the, you couldn't wait to get your driver's license. That was your, that was your ticket to freedom. That showed that you were, you were you becoming an adult, it. right? And you, you could actually um, see that, where, that you had a future. Uh, and so you couldn't wait. To, you couldn't wait to get your license. You couldn't wait to get your first car. And I wanted to understand the rationale that so many people have today, where they don't want a car. So I went and listened, and it was eye-opening. And this one young woman got up, and she said, basically, "So how much do you pay um, in your monthly car payment? <coughs> and how much do you pay for insurance? And how much do you pay in car repairs?" And what about the gas to put in the car um, every week? And what about all the other things that you need in order to do that? And you, you know, your, your AAA and all the other things that go along with that. She said, I choose not to do any of that because every other year I could take a big trip to Europe. And that's how I choose to use my money. So it made me start thinking more and more and saying, okay, let's look at it. So just let's go with the notion that $9,700 a year is what the average home spends um, on transportation. If we were, I'll probably get myself into trouble for suggesting this, but if we were to look at that 9700 and know that it only costs $840 a year for your yearly bus pass, you're looking at a $9,000 disposable income that you can use for other things. So, Carol, one of the things I want to do <laughs> is figure out how we can add the first two years of your bus pass into your first mortgage and relieve that family of the burden of transportation as you first are going into your first home. And then you have that gap, and now all of a sudden it eases the pressure from some of the, the, the pressers that, that are on a family trying to figure out how do you make that work. I mean, it used to kill me as mayor of, of work that two people working full-time minimum wage jobs used 85% of their income on the average rental apartment in the city of Warwick, if we could find one. So there's not a lot, so if we can reduce that, that stress on that family and they're in their housing, then we can help work on all the other things that we need to be able to um, put into place to make work. So I don't know how we can structure a mortgage to include transit, but I'm sure we've got to be able to figure out a way to do that, because that would free up over the first two years $18,000 for the average home to be able to use on other things. And it would, once we get people um, into the habit of taking public transportation, we basically know that we've captured them and we can keep them. Once we can get the first time someone rides and we can show them that it's easy, it's convenient, it's safe, it takes you to where you want to go, um, we pretty much know that we can keep them coming back. Um, so that's one of the things that, that we've been thinking about, what we would like to do. We have a fact sheet that shows how we get to the $9,700 um, and shows what the transportation component of all of that is. But it's going to take a whole change in thought 
of we cannot continue to let Ripta be seen solely as a way that poor people go to work. And so we've got to change the way that we operate. We've got, I mean, we've been doing some more, um, you know, express service and trying to show people that there are reasons to take the bus. I'll tell you that Rhode Island College just recently became the first um, public institution where you use your student pass as your bus pass, adding 4,500 riders a week. And for a student that was already paying a fee, um, to Rhode Island College to have that redeployed to give them their bus pass instead of working on parking lots. Mm -hmm. You know, see, this is how things change. Mm -hmm. I used to go to businesses and say, come to Warwick because we have lots of surface parking <laughs> and it, we, don't, we don't have a parking meter anywhere in the city. It's a wonderful thing. <laughs> now I go and say to a business, you, that surface parking lot could be better used for other things if you would help get your employees to take transit. Like housing. Yes. <laughs> and, and there are, but those are the different, those are the different connections that we need to make as a total package of saying, you know, let's look at the zoning codes. And I know you spent probably more time than anyone looking at them and that, but let's look at the zoning codes. And do, does it, do we really need to require one parking space per job in an industrial park when we could instead build more buildings there have more better tr public transportation to get people there and basically um, improve everyone's quality of life. So, just some thoughts. No, thank you. A very important uh, discussion. Just, just curious um, from folks, and, and I agree with your comment about the need to shift. I mean, if any of you go to any other major city using public transit is kind of a of uh, uh, a more wide scale uh, used by everybody. But just curious, who's been on the bus in the last 60 days? Raise your hand. Oh, more than I thought. Good. Glad to see that. So. That's my hip people back there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I definitely, the demographic was definitely going <laughs> <doing> lower. <laughs> but I mean, any of us, you know, if you've ever been to DC or New York, I mean, using public transportation is just kind of natural there and everybody uses it. Um, so that's the the goal, right, to kind of move towards that. I think the other piece of the conversation, and, and I know in my own community in Pawtucket, and I see Jan from the Pawtucket Foundation and other Ed and others, you know, we've, uh, the council has been struggling with uh, housing and affordability around the TOD district, and unfortunately has put that discussion on hold right now. And to me, it's like, oh, you're killing me, guys. You know, this is a logical place to put affordable housing, or at least to have some affordable housing options. So there's still a lot of, of of education that we need to do in local communities as well too. So, so with that, I'll throw out uh, one more question to all of you, and anyone can jump first. Just, I mean, a lot of what we're talking about, whether it's transportation, housing, health outcomes, is controlled at the local level, either through zoning or other programs. Um, so, can you talk a little bit about what your departments or agencies do to uh, develop relationships, help educate municipalities around the, your topic and issue, and your thoughts about what we could be doing more um, to kind of, again, um, help uh, communities um, develop um, and work towards mutual goals. So who would like to start? Anyone? Well, I can say what we are doing. Um, we do engage with municipalities a lot uh, and from a variety of, um, of perspectives. I think that are the ones that most people know about. We have the lead poisoning prevention program, we do lead inspections, review, enforcement, all of that is done in partnership with local communities and local municipalities specifically. And without the partnership with local municipalities will not be possible mm -hmm. to be accomplished. And we've seen tremendous improvements uh, in the relationship and in the response uh, that we've had in that program. But the one that I think I'm the most proud of, uh, it's absolutely our health equity zones. Because, uh, so our health equity zones is where we are doing a uh, braided funding approach. We're bringing funding from a variety of sources to give communities seed funding to do a needs assessment uh, or an assessment in general, come up with a plan of action and implement a plan of action. I am proud to say that some of those health equity zones are led by municipalities. Mm -hmm. uh, and when the municipality is not the backbone organization, the municipality is a key partner and at the table. We've had 
uh, with LISC and I see Jim here, they are one of our backbone organizations. They lead the Pawtucket Central Falls Health Equity Zone. The cities are totally involved with the mayors being a key partner at the table. Uh, we have Bristol leading a health equity zone and that's led by the city of Bristol. Uh, and so that's for me um, the key aspect, it's to have the municipalities, the local government be part of the conversation from the get-go. Be a partner and be someone that you can rely on because in, from a public health perspective, we do not have a local public health mm -hmm. infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, in this state, as we all know. So we need to build and rely on our local municipalities and local community partners to be that voice. I think that's key, <clears throat> the partnerships. Mm -hmm. I remember, well, I've been at Rhode Island Housing a long time, mm -hmm. almost 20 years. But I remember over the past 20 years, where we would run into roadblocks, right? We would propose, or a developer would propose housing in a certain community, um, and, and not to point to any communities, but a number of suburban <laughs> communities. Um, and, and there was this reluctance locally to embrace affordable housing. And, and I don't know what the perspective was. I don't know what people think we were going to finance in their communities. But now we have examples, right? We have Sweetbriar, we have Palmer Point, we have Shannock Falls, and we've demonstrated to our partners in the municipality that affordable housing isn't a blight on the community. It is an opportunity for the people that live in your municipality to have a place to live, right? So I think it's the partnerships that we've developed over time um, and demonstrating what affordable housing looks like and who lives there is, has really moved us forward. Yeah. And so, RIPTA has consistently been one of these amorphous groups, uh, not uh, quasi-public, so not really state government, not really sure that they are government. Um, <laughs> so, except for Amy and the planning department going out and meeting with um, people in the community pretty much ripped it to state on its own um, until the last year and a half, and I think they're still reeling a little bit from some of the changes that are going on. But trying to get um, out to virtually every community in the state and talk about service that we provide and what could make service better, where are the deficiencies, um, and trying to be seen as part of a response. So I think one of the um, one of the changing moments was when Newport um, suffered their power outage uh, a year ago in January. I had been ripped up just a few months. Um, and the new director of EMA, um, who I had worked with for many, many years, um, said, you know, we, we're going to need you guys to be part of this response. And I think that was a, a point of change for the mentality um, at the agency. And the authority saw that we could be part <coughs> of actually helping to solve a problem and, and being a good resource there. So a lot of the community involvement that's happened in the last year has been because we are doing the transit master plan, but a lot of the outreach also is a, is a new initiative to be out in the community, going to city and town council meetings, explaining service, having our flex group there to explain how we can better use service. We've been out, I've been probably to Kate Cantwell's group three or four times um, talking and just sitting and trying to resolve issues locally um, because we know that's where we can really have the biggest impact. So I know we have a couple of Hezes here as well too, so I'm glad that, uh, and I know Newport Hez and others are here, so thank you for joining us as well. Um, before I open it up to some Q&A uh, from our questions from uh, the audience, I do want to acknowledge a few other uh, folks. Um, when I m did my first round of advisory board uh, members, I know I forgot to mention Nancy Smith-Greer. Um, and Nancy is our, also our state director of our HUD office, a critical partner. So thank you, Nancy. And I see Kelly Mahoney uh, from URI in the back as well, too. Kelly, thank you for joining us. And wearing his uh, Rhode Island Realtor hat this morning, uh, but uh, he also, we have Councillor uh, David Salvatore here, who has always been a consistent supporter of housing. So thank you, David, as always, for being here. And I know you'll be joined later on at lunch by some of your other colleagues from Providence City Council. So thank you. Um, and then I, I was remiss in not uh, acknowledging one of our um, uh, 
uh, members of the board of directors of Roger Williams and a longtime friend of housing, Doris De Los Santos. And Doris is here and was uh, previously had worked at the Housing Resources Commission as well, too. And so I know she always gets housing as well. So thank you again, Doris, for coming and supporting us wearing your multiple hats. So. Um, so I'll stop there and uh, open it up to you for comments or, or questions of our panelists or, or for Annette. Who would like to start us? It's a shy group today. <laughs> Go right ahead and please say your name and where, where you're from too, just so everyone can uh, know. Sure. I'm Mike Somoli. I work for the Department of Health with Anna and Julian. And uh, I live in Providence. And my question is for Mr. Abadijan. So, Working in Providence, I have colleagues who were, live in Westerly, and they take the bus in every day, and they love it, they rave about it. It's the same, the low fare. I live two miles from work, and so when people say, well, you should take the bus too, but it would actually cost me more than <laughs> transportation. But I've heard you mention something about inner city urban planning. Do, can you say a little bit about what you envision for the close to downtown? Sure, the downtown transit connector, connector will open in January, right Amy? We were debating whether we were gonna make the date, but I think we figured out that we still will make that date. <laughs> It'll have five minute frequency from Providence Station to the hospital. And you'll have a number, you'll have six stops all the way along, but you'll never wait more than five minutes when you get out there to get a bus. And we're hopeful, our board just gave us approval, thank you Michelle, um, to look right, at um, how we can create a different downtown fair with the goal being that as you start to understand that you don't need to move your car at all all day if you did bring a car into the city that you could go anywhere you need to go in the city with minimal amount of walking um, we think that we can really gain a large amount of ridership there the other part the other feature of all of that is that these stops are going to have real-time boards in them. So it will tell you when the next Acela train to Boston is leaving. Mm -hmm. So we'll give you, we will have an ability to program it where you'll know the flight's leaving TF Green. So that you will be able to be connected all the way through. And you know, part of our goal at some point um, is to have someone who is coming here to go to Newport um, for a vacation in the summer, get off the, um, train at Providence Station, take the Ripta bus to the ferry, take the ferry to Newport, take the Ripta bus to their hotel, all using one fare product. Mm -hmm. And so then you have a seamless uh, ability to move people. And if we can do things like that and we can be creative and innovative, then I think we'll see um, ridership continue to grow. Thank you. Yeah, Jen. I'm Jan Bodie from Bodie 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 Foundation. Um, I, I know that the health bond is, is um, and we have the governor's November 14th. Mm -hmm. Is that a potential arena for modeling for yet another? I love the fact that you've got health, transportation, and housing closely linked. Um, ultimately, if we can't develop our hat on, if we can't pay for the bricks and mortar to build any of the levels, whether it's market rate or affordable, we're not going to improve our amount of housing. And there is a 30 percent gap. We used to fill it with other things. We have nothing to fill that except for project at this point. Pawtucket uh, has opportunity zone. It's qualified census tract. It's um, uh, has it, you name it. It's got it all, but it doesn't have the cash to fill that gap. So I would think that the lobbying by all these departments, all of these arenas, would really go a long way with our legislators and our. I just want to note that I did not plant that question. <laughs> <laughs> but I totally agree with it, so I'll let the panelists react. I think all of us own the lobby, right? Whether or not it's an agency, a public agency, we all own it. And let's not wait until the 14th, let's do it now, right? If we don't start lobbying now, then inevitably it's going to be too late. And, and I also think that from uh, being thinking about it differently and being creative, maybe we, we're not talking about another housing bond. Maybe we are talking about a healthy communities bond or a community development bond, bond that can bring all of those different components that we think we need in place. 
And I think as long as we continue to go at things from a very siloed perspective, it makes it harder for that partnership. But, but if we can create that vision for our local communities and go at it from that perspective, maybe it's a different approach that has different results and creates a new collaboration and a new partnership. Uh, and let's be honest, the people of this state have been very generous when they have looked at bond issues on how they're, they are, they're much smarter than they get credit for on how they view issues that get presented to them. And we've never had a housing bond that hasn't been approved. I think people understand the importance of that and where it fits into not only their own personal situations, but where it fits into a community. So. Um, a push and a concerted effort. I think, you know, there's always been a good coalition whenever there's been a housing bond um, out on the, on the ballot, and um, I see no reason why that probably won't even be expanded this time. So just on your comments, as you know, we uh, I've been working with our colleague uh, Jen at One Neighborhood on kind of just this health equity zone, uh, health equity uh, fund, um, looking at some models from other states. And I know you and Rhode Island Housing and others are joining us at that discussion coming up in November. I think housing advocates have also been very clear that bonds are great, but dedicated funding stream and kind of uh, consistent funding and money um, so that we're not necessarily at the whim of voters. We've been extremely lucky. Uh, three times, but uh, but I always get nervous <laughs> when we're just only relying on that. Obviously, political elections uh, can, can often be uh, difficult, challenging times as well, too. And so and many, many other states have kind of dedicated funding and dedicated money um, into housing so that there's some consistency as well, too. So I want my cake and eat it, and eat it too. I want both. So I'm, I'm not saying either or, but um, I, I don't want to take the uh, dedicated funding stream off the table either because I think it's been part of the problem as well. So any other questions? Christina. Yeah, so uh, I really appreciate uh, all of what you've spoken about on the intersection of health and housing and transportation, um, but I would just love to hear you speak a little bit more about racism and the disparity it creates and how it intersects with all of these um, issues and ultimately housing. I guess you asked me. Well, no, well, I, I, I guess, guess everybody, everybody, everybody <laughs> touch on that. I know we only have a little bit of time, but yeah. I, I would love to hear some, your, all of your opinions on that. Any other, any thoughts or, I mean, I think Scott started to talk about it earlier, you know, the perception of kind of public transportation in Rhode Island is that it's just for poor people um, and that, you know, kind of changing that perception around that. I think affordable housing obviously already has those image issues yes, and what we've right. tried to talk about is that it is really in everybody's problem. It's you know your son, my mother, everybody's uh, everybody's aunt, uncle, and other uh, family connections. So, but you're absolutely right. I mean, and I serve on the state housing appeals board, and unfortunately, here regularly um, from um, and it's not even it used to be hidden, you know, that people. But the last the political environment that we're currently in has kind of emboldened uh, many of those comments and the. The, the overt comments around racism and classism that come up at zoning board meetings, planning board meetings, everything else is alive and well. And I mean, it just continues to amaze and shock me every time um, when, I, when I hear it as, uh, as well. So I think you raised a good point. I think it's something as a community we don't talk enough about, and it's kind of those big questions. I think the Pezes have been trying to get at it as well, too. Uh, but just trying to get people to realize that uh, we're all all together in this, and that all of this we all do better if everyone in our community does better. And I think that was the foundation of the source of income bill. That's right. Right to make right. sure that people who have a rental subsidy aren't discriminated against when they knock on the door for an apartment. So um, I would encourage everyone to um, support that bill moving forward. We were not successful in getting that bill um, passed. So I'll look to everyone in the audience to put up their hand and, and help us as we try to move that bill forward. And, and I think, as you mentioned, at the end of the day, uh, it is a conversation that needs to be having. Um, we do talk about equity, we do talk about the social determinants of health, but at the end of the day, are the issues of racism and discrimination due to racism that are at the root causes of many of those? Um, it is people looking at you and treating you differently because of the color of your skin, because of your accent, because of how you look. 
uh, because of where you come from. I can tell you, I, I a few years ago, and I've told this story before, but my, uh, I think he's the unlucky one, my number three again. <laughs> this is another Daniel story, but Daniel, we had a, I was outside in my garden, and I was gardening, and uh, he fell from a tree. And um, he fell from a tree, broke his arm, and I took him to the hospital. I didn't change my clothes, I went as I was. And I was treated terribly at that mm -hmm. hospital. People look at me and I saw a black woman with dirty clothes and an accent. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. So when I got tired of that and I pulled my ID, which I say to people that's probably illegal and I shouldn't have done it, but I did that. And I told them, do you know who the hell you're talking to? You're talking to the executive director of the Department of Health at the time. Now I am the deputy director. But at the end of the day, I, didn't, I shouldn't be needing to pull an ID to be treated fairly. Or for my son to get pain medication for his arm, or for my son to be having an MRI done within less than an hour when he fell from a tree, had a concussion, and was throwing up already three oh, times mm -hmm. in that emergency room. Mm -hmm. That was my story. Mm -hmm. And the only reason that that happened, it's because of racism. Mm -hmm. It's because I do have an accent. Mm -hmm. Because I was looking like a poor, dirty, old, definitely <laughs> black boy. <laughs> But those are stories that happen to many people, people who cannot pull out an ID. So it's on us to make sure that we do address those things. It's on us to make sure that the policies that we have in place don't perpetuate those inequalities. We all know about redlining and how much that was a policy <coughs> that we created. So how many more policies are we still having in place that still create those inequalities mm -hmm. and those disparities? If I overlap a mapping of our burden of asthma in children and I overlay a map that has where affordable housing or poor housing is, and I overlay a map of where Medicaid rates are, Medicaid and birth children, that's all the same spots. Mm -hmm. So how much are we creating concentrated poverty and concentrated burden of disease and concentrated lack of opportunities for people that at the end of the day are driven by those discrimination, those racism, those policies that we create and that we also have the power to change. Agreed, and that's good. Yeah. <laughs> And we all know, and I know you know, that your zip code matters more um, uh, for your health outcome, your health expectancy outcomes, and your educational attainment, and even your job uh, advancement uh, more than any other numbers uh, that are associated with you. And so looking at things uh, holistically and as a community um, are critical. So thank you, Christina, for raising that, uh, raising that subject. Uh, time for, I think, maybe one more question. And then we'll uh, let people start to uh, walk over. Yeah, hi, Jordan. Welcome. Hi, uh, Bert Edwards with the Stanford office. Um, just generally speaking, um, you know, I've said this a few times in the past, but uh, there's no such thing as affordable housing for folks that don't have any income. And we can talk about developing and constructing new housing and even subsidies for that purpose. My question is, what are we doing to put the choice back in the hands of these folks that just don't have any income? There's no such thing as affordable housing, but they still need housing. Uh, what can we do to make uh, housing vouchers or the Section 8 program in Rhode Island? You know, obviously we can't change the federal laws in our state, but what is the state doing with state's own resources to provide choices and to try to deconcentrate some of that poverty we were just discussing? Do you want to talk a little bit, Carol? I can. I think, I think that you're spot on about the housing choice voucher program being a, a tool. Unfortunately, it's, it's limited, right? We only have a finite number of vouchers in the state of Rhode Island that can be deployed. And it, I think if you look across housing authorities in Rhode Island, they all have different priorities, right? And in many instances, their priorities are to house the people that live in, in their communities, right? They're not prioritizing homeless people who perhaps have zero income. Um, so that's one opportunity 
um, to change the landscape is to um, have housing authorities across the state prioritize um, homelessness um, in their scoring as they deploy their vouchers. Uh, I think the Continuum of Care program has done, um, and the participants in the Continuum of Care have done a great job in terms of applying for and receiving rental assistance, which is, is being deployed for people who are homeless. And, you know, Michelle Wilcox is here. Nobody knows more about people with zero income um, than Michelle and the folks at Crossroads. So are we doing enough? Absolutely not. Can we do more? Yes. Um, it's just a matter of how do we find the resources and how do we get the will with, with some of the people who control the resources to the, deploy them in a different manner. One of my um, unfinished bits of business um, as mayor was never being able to convince the city council to put out an affordable housing bond issue on the ballot so that we could leverage state funds as well. Um, but I think that local communities have to have a stake in it as well. Tell, tell your, for, your colleagues about that, <laughs> your former colleagues. Uh, thank you. Um, and thank you all, uh, again, for uh, coming and participating. I, I wanted to mention, too, at the back of the room, in addition to the census data and some of the other material, there's also a slip of paper encouraging you to provide feedback to FactBook. Um, we're always looking to improve and add to the document. Uh, so if you're willing to be one of our guinea pigs or one of our uh, uh, folks who uh, work and uh, uh, give us some more details or participate in the focus group, please take one of those papers and contact or talk to Annette. Uh, we will be, if you're joining us for lunch, there will be fact books uh, passed out at lunch, so you don't need to take one now, but if you're not able to uh, join us at lunch and would like a copy, Annette and uh, Christina and Karen L will make sure that you get a copy before you leave. And again, thank you so much um, to our friends and colleagues uh, for joining us this morning. Thanks to Ron uh, from Roger Williams for doing all of the technology for us. Thanks, Ron. <laughs> and um, and uh, look forward to seeing many of you over at the West End. A beautiful day for a nice leisurely stroll past the uh, Ripta Transit Lines and Rhode Island Housing Office and all of the good stuff. So. <laughs> Thank you all.